Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here in New York City with the amazing attorney, Nicholas Gravanti. Right now, I'm doing a series on traits of genius. We all have 24 traits of genius that some of us operate in and some of us don't. I was with a little boy who said, I'm not a genius. I'm not a genius. And in five minutes, I proved to him that he actually was because he was operating in some of the traits of genius that he didn't even realize. So I'm going to have some questions for Mr. Gravanti today about how he operates in those traits and what gives him the courage to operate in those traits. Those traits. So thank you for having me here today. I'm so happy to be here. No, Stacey, thank you for, uh, for interviewing me. I appreciate the opportunity. Excellent. Thank you. So the first question is, right now you've been working with a client that some would say is quite controversial because of his connection to former President Trump. And a lot of people just saying that name is sort of like, ah, you know, and you don't seem to have any back off when it comes to him. So you're operating in genius trait number two, which is courage. How do you operate so well in genius trait number two with regard to this scenario and other clients that you have? We'll get to that later. Um, it takes courage to, to do these things and things that others consider impossible. So what is your secret to operating courage? Stacy, I think in the first instance, you're uh, referring to one of my clients who has recently been in the news lately, who is the former chief financial officer for the Trump Organization. That's right. Uh, a wonderful man who, uh, unfortunately, because of his, you know, 50 years of dedication and loyalty to his boss and to his his employer, uh, found himself in a very difficult situation, um, and uh, there is no doubt that walking into the courthouse with him. Uh, resulted in my being subjected to mobs of people who were yelling obscenities at him yes. and uh, uh, really at me also uh, because yes. of the fact that I was representing him. Uh, but, you know, I take my obligations as a lawyer very seriously and uh, he is my client. I mean, he is an individual. Right. Uh, he, I was not representing uh, former President Trump. Uh, I was not representing the Trump Organization. I was representing an individual who is the chief financial officer, and my duties are to him and solely to him. So his affiliations, uh, regardless of whether people are biggest fans of Donald Trump or uh, people who detest Donald Trump, but yeah. no position on that politically. Right. I'm a lawyer, yes. and I, when I take on a client, uh, I want to take on a client that is an interesting client, that presents an interesting case yes. with an interesting legal challenge. Yes. And I don't really worry about you know, political affiliations. Wow. I don't worry about uh, whether people are going to be upset at me for taking on a representation because of my client's affiliation. Wow. I look to pick and choose among the cases that I'm offered for the most interesting cases, the most interesting matters, and I don't let the fact that uh, people might criticize me, and I have had friends criticize me. You have? Saying, oh, absolutely. I've had friends at my uh, at my club, uh, friends from law school, friends from <laughs> all over the place say, how can you represent that man? Right. You know, given that he's, he's worked for the Trump organization for, right, for 50 so many years. years. Wow. And say, uh, because he's my client. Wow. And because I don't pick clients based on uh, politi for political reasons or any other reasons. I wow. pick them because of the challenge representing them legally. And um, I've done that throughout my career. I mean, as, as a matter of fact, uh, I represented Hunter Biden 15 years ago. You did? I did. Wow. I did a solo case. I represented uh, Hunter Biden and uh, President Biden's brother, James Biden. Wow. In a civil case in New York County where wow. they were sued for uh, doing something uh, which really lacked all merit. I mean, I had yeah. the case thrown out of court. But I do not, you know, pick clients based on uh, whether they are Democrats or Republicans or, Republicans or right. any other reason. Yes. I pick clients that are interesting. Well, it's interesting you say that because as a singer, um, I sort of run into the same things. I, I was introduced to President Trump to sing um, the anthem for him. And someone wrote to me and said, oh, why would you sing for him? And I said, look, I sang for Hillary Clinton's um Democratic National Convention, I'll sing for the Republic. I just go sing, you know? And so the person said, well, it's like singing for Putin. And I was like, I think we're going a little too far. But some people, they do. And it's just like, you have to operate in courage. You have to operate in that integrity. And you just say, look, I'm doing my job. I go where I'm, you know, where I'm asked to go. And I represent myself, you know, like for what I do professionally. I'm not going to get caught up in what other people think. It's just, it's just important to operate in that because I have to sleep with myself at night. You know, I have to think, okay, did I do myself... Um, justice or was I worried about what other people think about me? So do you think that came from you growing up 
and the, the way you grew up in New York or did it come from just what you studied in law school? Like, where does that courage actually come from for you? Because you're just really I see that you're very emphatic about that viewpoint, which I admire. And you, you won't back down. And that's really admirable because a lot of people don't have that. Well, I think that I mean, part of it comes from being trained as a lawyer or as a lawyer, you are supposed to be able to take on any case. Wow. Um, it doesn't mean you have to take on every, any case, but you should be able to really uh, represent both sides of any commercial dispute. Yes. You should be able to function both as a prosecutor and as a defense lawyer. Yes. And what we do as lawyers is, if we're doing our job properly, we take the facts, we take the law yes. as it's presented and do the best case we can for our right. client. Right, right. So there are some lawyers who could say that they could never be prosecutors. I could never say that. There are right. some uh, lawyers who would say they can never be defense lawyers. Right. I can't say that. Right. I know in uh, many other countries, uh, lawyers are assigned to cases, and if there's a criminal case, for example, there will be two lawyers there, and one will be maybe handed the defense file, and one will be oh, handed wow. the prosecution file. Wow. And you do the best with, with what you whatever have. file yeah. you're given. That's doesn't right. doesn't matter, because we are just lawyers. In That's the end, right. We are not... You know, we are not the clients, uh, we are not, we are doing a job that we were trained to do, and I take that very seriously. So if the opinions of others who disagree with either the political affiliation of your client or uh, because they find what your client is accused of to be so repugnant that they yes. think you ought not to be representing them, if that is going to interfere with your ability to do your job, then I think that's a case you ought not to take on. That's right. But I think as lawyers, the way we are trained is to get beyond that. And do you find it a little more difficult these days with the media than it used to be? Because I feel like the media has definitely elevated um, with regard to uh, race relations and sort of what you're saying, politicizing things. I think the media speaks differently. They sometimes lean a little more to one side than the other. Do you find mm -hmm. anything changing for you when it, when it comes to that? Or do you just maintain your same position no matter what? I try to maintain my same position no matter what, but when you're talking about the media these days, yeah. I mean, what country we're living in and what is going on, yeah. uh, in your mind, is largely a function of what network you watch, especially That's true. if you watch a lot of cable news. <laughs> it's true, it's I mean, true. <laughs> I have friends that uh, watch MSNBC all day, I yeah. have friends that watch Fox News all yes, day, and yes. depending on which network they watch, yeah. uh, if that's all they watch, yes. uh, they could be living in different countries in different times. That's and right. Completely different views as to what's going on that's right. you know, in our country. So I think it's very important not to be influenced by the media, but yes. at the same time, I like to be informed about what the media is portraying a situation to be. Yeah. So I do, when I uh, have the time to, to watch cable news, yeah. I flip channels. And I okay. like to see. Good for you. I like to see what the people <laughs> on MSNBC are That's saying. That's so I smart. I like to see what the people on Fox are saying. Because, yeah. you know, it's important to appreciate always the other point of view that That's you may right. not have contemplated. And I think anyone who you know, is going to take a position, anyone who is going to even be involved in a dinner conversation yes. intelligently yes. about a controversial subject yes. needs to understand that many of these subjects are more complex yes. than uh, first meets the eye. That's and so smart. Being I being able love that. to flip the channels and get a chance to see, you know, what everybody different is viewpoints. saying. Different yeah, viewpoints that's on right. the same issue is very yes. important. Yes. And I do think, so I, I think part of the, the what you refer to as courage is a function of you know, being trained as a lawyer. Yes. Uh, but I think it's also, I mean, it, it's something that comes from being able to make choices without regard to what other people think. That's a big deal. And that is something that I think, uh, I think I left law school with that, and I don't yeah. think it was anything I was trained with in law school. I think it was just something that was very personal, likely ingrained in me by my parents yes. uh, when I was young. Yes. Uh, to just pursue my dream, pursue yes. what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, as people who have followed my career uh, are aware, I started out after law school working for w one of the most conservative, uh, sort of the whitest of white shoe law firms in the United States, and uh, one of the best law firms in the United States, where all they represented were really the cream of the crop, top fortune, 100 clients and banks and financial institutions, and it was uh, in my view at the time, uh, the best law firm in the United States and was also by far the most conservative. Wow. After about uh, four years working there, I made a career move which many considered me absolutely insane for making. 
I went to work for a criminal defense lawyer who, um, although he did a lot of white collar work, and he's recently deceased, he did a lot of work working uh, defense cases for organized crime defendants, uh, for drug dealers. Wow. And I learned how to live in the courtroom for in during those two years when I worked for yeah. him. Yes. So I got this amazing experience at this, you know, what I'll call the whitest of white shoe law firms yes. at the time yes. from 1985 to uh, when I graduated from law school to 1990. And then I went to work uh, for a lawyer who was in court all the time, which is where I learned how to try cases. Yes. Working for yes. Uh, clients who were accused of being, you know, major figures in organized crime, major wow. drug dealers. Do you recall other. why you made that decision I at the time? I made that decision because I wanted to learn how to try cases. Wow. Uh, but that was a very controversial yeah. decision. Yeah, yeah. My colleagues. I'm sure your parents were like, what are you doing? No, my, my parents actually, and they that support goes you. back to my upbringing and the courage I think that I derived from them encouraged me to do what I thought was best for my career. Wow. But there were uh, there were colleagues of mine from law school. There were friends of mine from uh, Duke University where I attended college. Uh, there were people at my you know original law firm who were shocked <laughs> that I would go uh, to work for a lawyer who was doing those kinds of cases. Wow. And it was a very controversial career decision wow. that I think very few people would have made. A lot of people questioned me for. And it took a lot of courage to make because there were so many people who discouraged me yes. from making that move. Wow. But it turned out to be one of the best career decisions. And I think it's actually the, the key decision that resulted in my becoming the lawyer that, that I've you are become today. today wow. 30, that is incredible. Years later. And it was based on a move that was considered insane. But you went with your gut on it. You went with, I you went perceived with my it. Gut. You felt like, you know what, I, this is what I should do. And you didn't listen to other people. And that's a big deal. I felt like I learned uh, a lot at my first law firm, which was a tremendous law firm, about how to be careful as a lawyer, how to write, uh, how to represent clients yes. uh, you know, to the best of my ability. But yes. there were you know, many large corporations and uh, other sort of very upscale kinds of uh, clients who were more involved in commercial disputes than anyone else. Yeah. It was a firm that rarely would have taken on yeah. know, really unpopular causes. Right. And then just switching full gear to, uh, you know, the other kinds of cases was something that, uh, you know, it was it was just a great move for me. But I had to disregard what others were saying. Yes, so, absolutely. I mean, the courage did play into that. And yeah. It resulted in my becoming really a trial lawyer because the thing I learned in the two years working for the criminal defense lawyer uh, that I worked for was I learned how to try cases. I wow. Li- I lived in court. Wow. And you know what? That encourages me to tell the young people that are watching to try to think about the future. And it's hard sometimes when you're in your 20s or when you're super young and you're just starting on a new career to think into the future that way. Because we always think about the now and what we're going through now and, and how to solve those problems now. But if you're thinking into the future and what that could help you with and what you can learn in that situation, it, it really could put you on a really great road to success. And that's, I, that is so true. And I think that that is also, it, that is, it comes into play when one is still in school. Yes. Uh, when uh, one is considering, what do I want to major in? Yes. Do I want to go to graduate school? Yes. If so, what graduate school do I want to attend? Yes. Do I want to get more than one postgraduate degree? Yes. Which I encourage kids when I talk to them, really all over, the, any kids I talk to, including my own, I encourage them, education, education, yes. education. Yes. Get as many degrees while you're in school mode as you can. Yes. It's not that Beautiful. they're all going to necessarily come into play. Uh, I urge kids, go get a law degree, even if you're not interested in practicing wow. law. Wow. Because the training you're going to get is going to be incredible. Wow. And kids will tell me sometimes, well, you know, I'm not interested in law. I'm interested in astronomy, or I'm interested yeah. in sports, or yeah. I'm interested in entertainment. Well, but you need law in those in those you, different industries. Are, look, look so I the, wish I would have done that. Look it would have helped me so much as an National artist. Basketball Association, right. who I used to share an office with. He's a lawyer. First law, wow. He's a lawyer. Wow. You go, but they're a general counsel uh, wow. at every major company. Wow. They're interested in space. They'll become the wow. in-house job working for NASA. Wow. Uh, you're interested in entertainment. Yeah. Entertainment law. Yeah. Go in-house working for That's motion so smart. picture companies. There is nothing that. You cannot do with a law degree in any field because lawyers. You're going to always need to know what that law is in about. In all areas, and you can pursue your dreams. But my point is education and getting as much education as you can it's very while important. you're in education mode, in my yeah. view, is very important. Well, I love that. Whether it's an MBA, a JD, no matter what. But then, wow. what's a JD? Out, JD is a law degree. Okay. And an MBA, obviously, business 
Okay. Okay. Good. And I would just urge uh, kids to take the long view and get as much education as you can while you're in education mode, because it is sometimes difficult to stop in a career yeah. and then go back, then to, go back school to school and then resume it's your true. career. It's true. So I take. I tell kids to take the long view yeah. while they're in school. Mode. I like that term, taking the long view. And then after that, when you get out, you've got to make career decisions. You know, it's it seems like when you when you get out of law school and you're, you know, I was just four years out of law school and I made this very controversial career decision. Yeah. And that was the first, and then I worked for the new lawyer for two years. So you're talking about the first six years of my career, and yeah. it seems like at that point that. Now, that's a big portion of your career. Yeah. But now that I've been practicing some law for 37 yeah. years, yeah. I look back to those first like six baby years. baby years, and I said, right? Like, <laughs> I was an infant yes. in practicing. Yes. So yes. I did take the long view in terms of the lawyer I wanted to be. Yes. Being able to handle complex civil matters as I was trained and to do And you did it in a genius firm. way. And uh, <laughs> some of the most controversial criminal cases that wow. I have that I have worked on in, uh, you know, interesting matters I continue to work on. Wow. But the long view and re recognizing that the long view, you know, I love you're it. in your 20s and you're in your uh, early 30s, yeah. uh, you got you're not a thinking about 50, 60 years Nobody's old. You do. At 60 it's, or true. It's, true. it's true. It's true. People are working until their 80s. you got a long way to go. Make it's the right true. decisions and take the long view. Have courage. Have courage. Have I love courage. it. Okay. We're going to go to question number two, genius trait number five. Okay. As an attorney who's achieved so much success, how do you find it difficult to use genius trait number five, honesty? Okay. In a world full of deception and what seems to be unfair to honest people, how do you stay true to yourself and to, to be honest? And what advice would you give to people who are watching to not operate in fear and to always be honest. I mean, I think like, unfortunately, some attorneys do have a sort of, we sort of put this sort of um, tag on them that are, are, are attorneys honest? Do they operate in honesty? And so I think I would like to know how you operate with genius number five, honesty in your career. I, I think that honesty, and it, it's really another way to define it is almost credibility. Yes, Because as That's soon as true. you are dishonest once and you, lie, you lose credibility, um, you're done. And that could be in a trial. I mean, a trial is, in the end, when you get up and give a closing statement, when I look at those jurors, if I, at the end of a long trial, do not have credibility with the jury, yeah. I might as well not get up and give wow. my closing argument because wow. I, my client is not going to have a chance. Wow. So from the day that we start jury selection to the day that I get up to give, uh, to give my closing statement, maintaining credibility at all times wow. not exaggerating not saying anything that i you know not saying that i can prove anything that ultimately i cannot prove yes. not saying anything which my adversary in court and i usually have pretty able adversaries yes. are not able to disprove yes those things are very very important so you learn about you know the importance of honesty and credibility as a trial lawyer all the time wow but even more generally with uh colleagues uh with your law partners with adversaries generally uh with judges it takes years and years and years to build up a reputation yes. as a person who is an honest and yes. credible person. Yes. Years to build up that reputation. That's and right. it is very And important. it takes like five minutes to ruin it. It takes five <laughs> seconds to ruin right. it. it five seconds. It's true, it's true. So you have got to be uh, you've got to maintain credibility yeah. all the time. Yeah. Because once you blow it, it could take a long time to get it back. To get it back, I if know. you ever can. Yes. So that's it's, true. Uh, it is very important to be honest, and that's not. It's, it's it's not just being honest as a lawyer with jurors. It's being honest with your own client. At yes. Times. Yes. I mean, you have to sometimes tell your clients things they don't want to hear. Right. And I lose a lot of cases because a client will come to me and they will want to handle a case a certain way. And, you know, the client makes a decision, so usually I will be willing to handle it whichever way the client really wants, because ultimately the client directs the lawyer. Right. But sometimes clients don't want to hire me because I don't tell them what they want to hear. Wow. I don't want to yeah, tell them And you them just turn down the money, you turn down the check, you're like, this is what oh, it is. I say, look, I'll, I, I can pursue that strategy 
But I'm telling you in my heart, that I, don't think I don't believe work. that's the best strategy wow. for you. Yeah. And I don't think you're going to end up where you think you're going to end up. Right. I think you're going to end up a better place if you follow my strategy. Right. But there are clients that come in yeah. already pre-programmed with the notion that they know how this case ought to be handled. Right. And if I tell them, I agree with you, I should handle it exactly that way. Yeah. And I'm dishonest with them. Yes. Then I'm more likely to get hired sometimes yeah. than actually giving the client, uh, the prospective client, right. you know, difficult advice that I don't see it their way and I would do something differently. So right. you've got to be honest with your clients. Um, you know, in a recent case I had, I mean, Look, it's no secret if you're a criminal defense lawyer and you're being paid, it's a, you make a lot more money going to trial yeah. uh, and doing a three or four month yeah. trial than yeah. you walking to a, into a courtroom and entering a plea of guilty, yeah. which takes an hour. Right, right, as right. As opposed to being on trial <laughs> for three months. Right. But that doesn't mean you advise all your clients to go to trial. Right. Uh, because it may be more lucrative for the lawyer. Right. I mean, you've got to be honest with your client, even if sometimes it means that, uh, you know, you're going to make a lot less money so to yeah. speak your fees are going to be a lot lower yeah you got to give clients yeah, honest honesty. advice i think uh, i think um like in the question i was talking about like fear because i think like even for me as an artist um i find myself sometimes going okay well if i'm honest about my age or if i'm honest about this or i'm honest about that then will they hire me or will i be able to move forward you know and i think like sometimes people get into this state of fear of because they they want to survive so they get into a survival mode um so i think that you have to have faith and i think you have to always operate in honesty because like you're saying in the end for credibility and for success to really occur that honesty is always going to outweigh anything you could make up in the moment because it's not going to it's not going to work that that is so important and i think that i mean for example i sometimes get offered cases where people will ask about my area my, my expertise in a certain subject matter area mm -hmm. and to be frank i have no expertise in any subject matter <laughs> other than being a good lawyer right a good trial that's lawyer, great a good yeah. litigator yeah i am not an expert in the sense that i work on one kind of case all the time. I'm not a medical malpractice lawyer who right. knows how to read medical files. Right. I am a general litigator and I learn the facts of my cases as they come along. Uh, I, I love represented it. earlier in my career representing Calvin Klein. I knew nothing about the you know the garment business right the, uh, the fashion the fashion industry, biz yeah. industry. Yeah. yeah but i learned what i needed to learn yes. and i tell clients that all the time when they come in and they ask me for example cryptocurrency i had a client uh, <laughs> about three or four weeks <laughs> oh, ago who goodness. asked me about my expertise in cryptocurrency yeah because there was a cryptocurrency situation a potential litigation that they were talking to me about possibly representing them in and I was honest with them. Now, I knew that that, that might cause them to say, well, thank you very much. Right. Uh, it yeah. was nice meeting you. And they're going to walk yeah. out the door. Yeah. And I said to them, I know absolutely nothing Good about job. cryptocurrency. <laughs> just like I knew absolutely nothing about so many of the other areas. Yeah. That but you I learned about it. Learn you about studied it. to be a litigator because wow. that's what I do. Great. You learn about it. And yeah. I assured uh, you know these prospective clients that notwithstanding my ignorance about cryptocurrency, uh, I would as I have always done. I learn what I need to learn in, in order, order to get to, the job done. Wow. And you don't That's need to great. become an expert in every subject yeah. matter in order right. to present clients. But you can't have the fear uh, of not being honest with people about the fact that, you know, cryptocurrency, uh, I, I, I don't know. know. Right. <laughs> I, I've read about it. I've seen yeah. a little bit about it. There are other lawyers at my firm who are experts in it. Yes. But I know very little about it. I don't Good for want you. to know anything about it. Good uh, for you. But that's you very gotta, admirable. You got to overcome the fear, and you got to be honest with people. I love because it. Because if not, they'll see through it pretty quickly if they're sharp. That's true. That's very, very true. Okay, we're going to get to question number three now. Which, by the way, I'm loving these answers. Thank you so much. With cases that may be difficult, where you are fighting with a great desire, of course, to win for your client. How do you operate in genius trait number six, optimism? Optimism? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I will tell you this. I am, I was born an optimistic person. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I yes. could show you if I, uh, if I were uh, right now at my weekend home in Pennsylvania, I could pull out my high school yearbook and I could show you when people were voted class this, class that, class yeah. everything else. Yeah. I was actually voted class optimist. No way. I was in 1978. <laughs> I okay. love that. And I don't know why my fellow classmates uh well, Is that true? You really were? I, That's amazing. I, I, will, I love I will that. Send you after this interview. I'll take a picture of my high school yearbook this That's weekend. And I will that is that genius. You. I will show that to you. 
<laughs> because I have always been an optimistic person wow. by nature. So that, for some reason, has always come naturally. Yes. And I think you've got to make the best of a situation. Yes. You know, no matter what it is. Yes. Um, you understand. You've got to be a realist. But, yes. You know, in life. Why don't you define for our audience optimism? <sighs> Optimism is that there are a number of ways that different situations can turn out. You can't dwell on all of the negative turns that something could take. Right. I think you've got to focus on the positive and you've got to muster your energy to trying to achieve through you know, hard work, dedication, persistence, trying to achieve that you know, best result possible. Yes. Um, and you've got to be prepared at the same time that things always don't you know, play out as planned. Right. And sometimes things don't go well. So I tell kids, whether they're applying to colleges, they're applying here, they're applying for jobs, Take a chance. Go apply. Go do something and be optimistic. You know, I tell kids sometimes who are desperate to get their foot in the door in a certain industry, but uh, they know there's no chance of them getting a paying job in the first instance. If you can afford it and if you can do it, go do an unpaid internship. Work hard. Get to meet people. Yes. Uh, network within there. And if people like you and they see you're a hard worker, yeah. watch how quickly that will develop into yes. a paying job. Be optimistic yes. about the opportunities that... Taking chances are going to yield for you. Well, that's definitely and, genius to do and, that. Now how, now, how does that apply to your clients? So say you have a client that comes in that's really, really down and out about the case they're working on with you. And they feel like there's no way they're going to win. And they feel sad all the time. And they're just really, really sort of just melancholy about the situation. How do you encourage your clients to use their genius trait number? Well, you've got, you've got tension now between your honesty and yeah, your yeah. <laughs> Because, I mean, on the one hand, right, you're like, well, you might be right. There may be a great, yeah, there may be a very good reason for yeah, them to be yeah. pessimistic and melancholy yeah. about their legal situation. Yeah. And I have to remind them that you know they may have it uh, exactly right. Yeah. On the other hand, once we choose to go down a path, for example, let's assume there's a client that I've advised not to go to trial uh, that wants to go to trial. Yeah. I think the client would be better off working out some sort of an alternative disposition of uh, his or her case or company's case, yeah. uh, but they want to go to trial. At that point, all you focus on is winning the trial. And that's you don't focus on, that. after, mm -hmm. well, we're going to win this trial now. Mm -hmm. uh, you put out of your head the fact that you advise the client not to go to trial. Yeah. It's what are we going to do every day? Right. Uh, we're going to work you know, we're going to work our butts off yeah. day in and day out to win this trial. That's right. Because that's the path we've gone down. Yes. We're not going to look back. Right. We're not going to look at the client and say, you know, if things start going poorly at trial, yes. look over and say, I told you so. Yeah. Uh, that's not, you know, it's yes. full speed ahead yes. toward victory. And that's, that's, I love it. That's what you've got to do. That's very amazing. And you've got to be optimistic that you're going to win. Yes. And uh, fortunately, I mean, in my career, I'm, I've had tremendous success with the juries getting up and, you know, saying the right things. Yes. Whether I'm it's as a criminal defense lawyer, getting up and saying not guilty, or as a civil lawyer, getting up and uh, either, you know, finding my clients not liable if they're being, you know, sued for something, yes. or finding, uh, you know, entities that I am suing on behalf of others liable in civil cases. Yes. So, and I would think that this client you have now that used to work for President Trump, I, I would think that he must be a pretty optimistic person because, I mean, he's, he's under fire. And, I'm, you know, he's just operating in his honesty and his integrity. And he's being optimistic because he's not going to allow the media or what people think about President Trump to come in to affect him. Do you find that with him the, the case? Or? That, that, that's definitely the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, in his case, he's a 75-year-old um, man who's worked hard his entire life. And um, I think in the end, he had to make some very difficult decisions about how he was going to handle his case. Yes. And, um, you know, look, he had a duty, you know, obviously to people he has worked for who have been loyal to him for years and yes. he wants to treat them well. Yes. But he also has a wife, he has children, he has grandchildren. That yeah, he he's a real person. Right by, and he needs yeah. to do right by himself. That's right. So, I mean, I think that uh, people have to really... Uh, do what's best for themselves yes. in certain situations and not be affected by what others think. That's right. That goes back to courage. That's sense. right. This is going so well. I'm enjoying this so much. I have to say I'm I'm learning a lot as well. OK, we're going to go to question number four. And obviously, as a lawyer, um, this applies to you very much. And I would say your ability to judge. OK, it's a big one. I mean, when you're taking on a client and he confesses his innocence or when he's saying that this is the truth, how are you able to use genius trait number seven, ability to judge when signing on a new case? 
that's difficult only because I am someone who does form snap impressions about people. Okay. And I can form judgments immediately yeah. with respect to whether a client <laughs> is telling me the truth, yeah. whether a client is lying. Uh, you, even in the non-law aspects of my life, uh, friends that I meet, whether these are genuine people or whether these are people that you know, you've got to keep your eye on. Yeah. Um, I form snap judgments, but what I, I think as you grow older, the thing that you learn is that first impressions are not always correct. Right. And there are times where, although I do form judgments immediately about certain things, and I trust my judgment because it usually is on the mark, yes. but it isn't always on the mark. Okay. And you've got to be willing in life to just sign just admit sometimes that someone who you thought was the most honest client in the world has come in and completely pulled the wool over my eyes. Oh, no. And I've got to be willing to accept the fact that I've got it so wrong from the beginning. Right, right. And I've had the opposite point of view. Yeah. Someone who has walked in the room and I said, this person is... Such a liar. woman is lying through their teeth to me. Right. And then I've come to realize months uh, later... That they were true. That they were true. absolutely wow. truthful and they're wow. not the person I thought them. Wow. That they were... Uh, originally. So I think being open-minded, I mean, there's yeah. nothing wrong with using your judgment because judgment is so important. It is. You it know, is. And that's what we do as lawyers. I mean, if it were easy to make legal decisions because you always did something the same way in every case. For example, um, sometimes you have cases where a client has the option to testify before a grand jury, before he or she is indicted. And I've had clients where uh, I have, there are some lawyers who will never advise a client to uh, testify before a grand jury. There are other lawyers that seem like you know they often do. Uh, when it comes to asserting the Fifth Amendment, there are some criminal defense lawyers who believe that they all, anytime you can uh, assert the Fifth Amendment, it's better to do so. Because Tell the audience in, what the Fifth Amendment is. The Fifth is. Amendment is a constitutional right not to incriminate yourself by giving testimony that's being compelled from you. So you have a right in certain proceedings to assert the Fifth Amendment and say, I do not want to testify on the grounds that there is a tendency for my answers to possibly incriminate me. Right. Now, the Fifth Amendment is for the innocent as well as for people who are guilty. So I don't want anyone to be under the mistaken view that the Fifth Amendment is only asserted by people who are guilty uh, because the Supreme Court has expressly held that it is just as much a valuable protection for the innocent but in the media, in the press, with yeah. one's colleagues, yeah. asserting the Fifth Amendment is often perceived as the equivalent of guilt. It's true. <laughs> but but my, my, my point is that if I were a computer and, uh, and the answer were always to put a client into the grand jury when they had an interesting story to tell, or the answer was always to tell a client to assert the Fifth Amendment in any situation where they might be in criminal jeopardy, yeah. then we might as well just have computers as well. Right, right, right. Judgment needs this to be robots. exercised. I've got to yeah. look at the person. Yeah. I've got to listen to the person. Yeah. I've got to look at the composition of yeah. the grand jury. Yeah. Uh, where are we? What venue are we in? Yeah. Are we in Manhattan or are we in, you know, some, uh, you know, small town in Texas? Because yeah. there's a difference between how my client is going to be judged. Wow. Uh, there's a difference in the advice I might give. There's a wow. difference based on the client, how the client wow. comes off. Does the client come off as arrogant? Does the client come off as sincere and genuine? Wow. So judgment, There's so many different variables. There are very different variables. And in the end, the advice I give is based on judgment. So wow. judgment is important. And um, it's something that, uh, you know. I love that. The ability to judge. Well, you sound like a genius at it. Uh, Good job. <laughs> you know okay. Stated. This one, I am so interested in asking you and i think a lot of people in the audience will be as well because this is a big one okay question number five trait number nine is willingness to take chances all right so you just signed on another very controversial client by the name of kanye west and i think in this case we have to say that you are definitely a genius and operating with willingness to take chances has come into play okay so where tell us i mean just tell us about that like how are you so confident shaking hands with kanye west we know that he's one of the most controversial celebrities in the world but also very loved by many i mean he is very loved i mean he's controversial but let's face it he's his music is amazing he's he has very fashion forward um ideas and right now he's in a big controversy with gap i think and you're his lawyer on that so Tell us about that. Well, why did you? All, why are you operating in willingness I, to take chances here? Well, uh, I, I think that 
again. I mean, I put Kanye Ye is his uh, new name. Oh, Probably Ye. Know that okay. That is his legal name. Okay. Ye, Ye but, is his legal name now? Le- yes, his new legal name is now Ye. Oh, wow. So Y-E. he changed it from changed Kanye it. to Actually, Ye. Actually, on my retainer agreement, when I first sent it out to him, I was told by his acting general counsel that I had to change the name on the retainer agreement. To Ye? You take off Kanye West and you do. Wow. Uh, dear Ye. Wow. Y-E, and that is his name. Just Y-E. He has officially changed, legally changed his He's name. He's legally changed but, his name and is breaking here, right here on my channel. <laughs> you talk about In it, case you didn't know it. But if you want to talk about traits of genius. Yes. Ye is a genius. Yeah. And I have, I agree. you know, I, I knew about some of his music and I knew about some of his background. Uh, I recently watched he is a, a, a Netflix series with yes. his background and yes. learned a lot more about him that yes. I did not know. I'm going to tell and you something. I've watched that genius, series. You ought to interview him because and he is a genius. I would love to interview him. Maybe you could work it out for me. Um, <laughs> I watched that Netflix series and that's when I, I totally fell in love with him as an artist. Like I, I watched him with his relationship with his mom and I did, when I was younger, I did see, get a chance to see him live in person at a club in New York City and I just, I thought he was always a genius and uh, pardon the pun, that's the name of the Netflix series, Genius, right? Um, and so I, but he has come under fire a lot. Um, he, a lot of people don't understand uh, his viewpoint and how he's so successful. He he definitely works in genius traits. I mean, I would love to sit and ask him about his courage level, you know? But for you and your willingness to take chances, I guess you watched the Netflix series and you, 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 like us, fell in love with him. And so you're just like, okay, let's go. Oh, well, I watched the Netflix series actually after I started representing. Okay, him, so why did you why did you why, why did you sign him then? Why did uh, you? Well, I, I, he was referred to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I when I understood the nature of the commercial disputes because this is not nothing to do with the criminal law. This is completely business issues mm-hmm. that uh, I'm representing him in connection. Are you able with. to tell us anything about that case? No, not much. Other okay. than I think that if one uh, looks at his into Instagram, yeah, uh, you'll see more. Tweets <laughs> and posts, you'll see more. It's obvious he has differences of opinion with the way his merchandise ought to be uh, marketed and sold and he yeah. believes that there's a lot more of it that should be flying off the shelves if it were handled uh, oh, properly. Oh, better. Uh-huh. And I think he's probably right about that. Okay. Uh, I, doubt, I know he's right about that. Actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I, I, I didn't even think twice about representing him. Again, he's controversial uh, but you know, you, so is you see anybody an, you, affiliated you see with an Donald Trump. You see an injustice Trump. there. You so see an I, injustice I see, there. I see, look, I see a client who believes that you know their rights are not being fully respected under contractual agreements mm-hmm. and I'm going to pursue uh, the remedies that are available under the law to try to help them make sure that their contractual rights are enforced. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he's a controversial uh, figure, yes, uh, much like, you know, our former president, uh, Donald Trump is. That's right. Uh, but that doesn't dissuade me, that doesn't deter me in any way uh, from taking him on as a client. His legal issues are straightforward. I mean, there are, right. there are licensing see- contracts that have to be interpreted and we have to figure out, you know, who is not living up to their end of the bargain, so to speak. And right. That's what we do as lawyers. And if, and if uh, the people with whom he's entered into licensing agreements are not doing what they ought to be doing, well, then there are legal remedies that need yes. to be pursued. Yes. But the fact that he's controversial, the fact that, you know, he ran for president and <laughs> he ran for president again, I'm Yeah, told, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. that, uh, you know, doesn't deter me at all. I actually, uh, that's part of the fun of practicing law. It's taking yeah. on challenging cases, taking on interesting clients, taking yeah. on uh, clients that, you know, people at uh, at cocktail parties or at dinner, you know, like to bring up and say, what's it like to yeah, work yeah, yeah. this person? What's yeah. it like to work on that case? I see the That's- running theme through your, through you talking to us in this interview, the running theme is definitely your ability to look for yourself, your ability to assess for yourself without the influence of so many people around you, without the influence of the media, without, you know, without feeling any sense of fear, you have a strong ability to be able to observe and look for yourself at the situation and look at the facts. That is true. I mean, look, I'm very independent and I do make my own situations. I'm, I'm with a larger law firm, so mm-hmm. obviously sometimes the views of my partners come into Yeah, play, of course. And I respect those, mm-hmm. you know, my partners. But I'm sure they respect your views, decisions because of your success. Their, well, we make collective decisions because yes. we are partners. Yes. We are law partners. And sometimes, right. you know, we have to make the decisions that are in the best interest of the firm, yes. even if I might do something differently. But, yes. Uh, so I take their views into account, but I also, I mean, I am very independent, but there are four people whose views I really do take into account very seriously. My wife's and my three boys. 
<laughs> great. Go. I've got, you know, I've been uh, going on 30 years, my 30th year uh, anniversary. Congratulations. Coming up in That's amazing. And I've got three boys, uh, twins who are 20 and a boy who's 17. Wow. And I like bouncing things off them. Because yeah. Because it is amazing how many things they know. Yes. That I know absolutely nothing about. I have an 11 year old. I have to say, I have the same thing for me. I and just I ask her questions sometimes. And, uh, and I'm like, know, okay, I they, would, they're very smart. Kids have insights. It's a different they thing talk, these days. They're on yeah. social media. Yep. Uh, I know very little bit about very little about social media, and just getting the views of my wife, getting the views of my kids, mm-hmm. uh, that really does influence me a lot more than what my friends are thinking or what my former law school classmates yeah. are thinking yeah. Yeah. or what others that uh, you know friends with whom I socialize are thinking. Yeah. Uh, I do take the views of my wife and kids into yeah. account sometimes. And that's beautiful. But in the end, I make my own decisions. Yeah. Uh, not everybody agrees with every decision I make. Yeah. And it's not like every decision I've made with respect to what clients to take on, what case to take on, yeah. have been uh, correct. But you know, you don't look back. Right. Uh, you make a decision, you move forward. That's right. And it's like just like with career choices. Yes. You know, sometimes That's there's right. a fork in the road. Yeah. And you've got to go one way or the other. Yeah. And you never know where, had you gone in that other direction, what would have it would have right. taken you. Yes. Uh, you know you took the other direction. Yeah. But you can't look back. That's you gotta right. you got to plow forward. That's right. And wait for the next fork in the road. Yes. And use your judgment and have the courage to make the right decision. And use your as genius those traits. Present themselves. Right? <laughs> exactly. That is incredible. I love that. And I love that you, you know, I do admire Ye. Is that his new name? Okay, yeah. Now, the, the last question I want to ask before we go to the, the sixth um, question in the interview is it? Do you think he changed his name? Like, remember when Prince changed his name? Remember the the art? He changed well, his name to the artist. You've got Prince. You've got Madonna. You've got yeah. people that have one word names. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why he changed. Oh, his okay, okay. Name. No, I, I didn't know, know if it was I like wish- like for example, Prince had changed his name, I believe, because. Um, he was in a deal with Warner Brothers and he had to change his name in order to sort of change the legality of his contract or something. I don't know if, if, if Kanye was doing that. You don't know. I had absolutely nothing okay, to I wanna, do with so, the change of name. That's why I told you. When I sent him the change <laughs> agreement, I addressed it to, it's to Kanye, Kanye, Kanye West. West. Okay. I've always known him as Kanye West. Okay, I love it. Well, hopefully I'll get an interview with him and I can ask him why he changed his name. Ask. Okay, so I'm thoroughly enjoying this interview. I'm learning so much and I'm just being so encouraged to work, work in my own genius traits um even better so our last question is genius trait number 12 persuasion is there a course in law school first of all on persuasion because i just feel like lawyers are so uh persuasive you know it takes a genius obviously to be a lawyer um let's face it okay so without giving away too many of your secrets how would you advise our viewers to operate in their careers in order to be successful using genius trait number 12 persuasion I don't think there is anything that is exclusive to the legal profession in terms of persuasion. Uh, we try to persuade our kids to do that which we think is best for them. That's true. We try to persuade our friends that our views on different controversial issues are correct. Uh, just as lawyers try to persuade judges and juries that our clients are in the right rather than wrong. Yes. And I think, again, going back to one of your... Uh, you called it honesty, and I said honesty is tantamount to credibility. Yes. It almost mean the same things. Yes. Maintaining credibility yes. by saying things that always make sense, uh, yes. saying things that are accurate, yes. uh, never misrepresenting the facts is a very important part of persuasion. Yes. And then you want to emphasize, emphasize the your strong points. Uh, you want to de-emphasize the weaker points, but you can't ignore the, the weaker points. You know, when people argue about things, there's usually not one right or wrong answer. There may be one answer that's more right mm. than, than another mm-hmm. answer, mm-hmm. but there's always a countervailing point of view. Otherwise, you wouldn't have be having an argument, you know, right. unless you're you know, right. sitting there with someone that's, yes. you know, completely empty. <laughs> uh, but, so you've got people, smart people, that have different views, and there are. You, you've got to remember. You want to emphasize uh, the facts if you're trying to persuade someone that are your most persuasive facts. Yes. You want to try to spend little time discussing the facts that counter your view, but you also need to be ready to have an answer and to explain away um, the facts that do not support your view. And that's one of the things that we are trained to do in law school. I mean, you've got to be prepared. And when I go into an oral argument, I will tell the lawyers that I'm working with uh, who are not as close to the case as I am, uh, I said, I want you to make believe you're, you're going to be the judge. You're not going. You're going to spend three or four hours reading these briefs, right. and then you're going to come in for an oral argument. Yes. And you're not going to know the case as thoroughly as I do. Right. I want you to come up with the most difficult questions that I am going to be asked. Yes. The really hard questions. Yes. The weakest part of my case. Yes. And tell me what you think the best answers are, and then because I got to be prepared 
to respond to the most difficult questions yes. that I could be asked. Yes. And I think in terms of persuading people, you need to be willing in advance to understand the opposite point of view. The yes. point of view that oh, they want to take. And you've got to be willing that's to true. anticipate the arguments they're going to make. Yes. And be ready to counter them with yes. why something that you know you anticipate they're going to argue about why their position is right and mine is wrong. Yes. Why I think they're putting too much weight on it or why it's not correct. You gotta respect other people's views. That's right. Okay? You cannot dismiss the views of people just because they disagree with you. If right. you really want to be persuasive and you want to keep credibility, yes. You need to you know you need to really emphasize and you need to treat uh, people with different views respectfully yes. and really try to point out what the flaws in their thinking are. I love that answer. That was beautiful. Okay, so before we finish off, because I'm an artist and, and I'm just so curious to know about you and if you work with any artistry inside your career as a lawyer, um, how do you apply anything from the art field, whether it's whatever? Like, Do you apply anything in the courtroom or in your life using art? I have had some art cases, but I am not an artist, okay. and I am not someone who is, uh, you know, I'm not going to paint anything, I'm not going <laughs> to sculpt anything, I'm, okay. I'm, not, I'm not an artist. Okay. But I think that, you know, as a trial lawyer, uh, much like uh, whether it's a producer or a director, somebody who puts on a Broadway show. Yes. Okay? Yes. Uh, putting together <laughs> a team of people yeah. that work together yes. uh, to pull off a show. Because the show isn't just the actors on the stage. Yes. It's not just me getting up it's in a presentation and giving the... No, yeah. it's the people behind the scenes. Wow. You have to have, okay? You walk into Broadway and you watch a beautiful Broadway oh, that's performance. True. That's true. There are the stage hands in back. There are the people doing the makeup. There are yes. the people doing the lights. That's right. There are the people who wrote the play. Yes. There are the people doing the music. There's yes. the orchestra. Yes. In order for a Broadway show to come to together yeah. and to be a piece of you know yeah great i know work. i worked on broadway for six years by the way a, but it's a, team it's a team of people definitely some of whom you never see people behind that's the right. scenes and that's what doing a trial is like wow i may get all the attention because i'm the one getting up giving the opening statement wow i'm doing the cross-examination of the important witness yes i'm getting up and giving the closing statement yes and at the end of the day when the press wants to interview me about the case yes i'm the one giving the interview right but I have other lawyers on the team, some of whom are in court, and some of whom are not in court. Yes. We're preparing briefs that have to go into the judge. Right. We have people working on graphics. We wow. have people behind the scenes in every aspect of trying a case. You need people who know the law. You need people who are great writers. You need wow. people who can do great wow. graphics. You need I don't people. think any of us really thought about that, right? Like, we just sort of think, okay, this is the trial. Like, the trial? you know, as you know, the very famous trial that was in, in very public, obviously, was the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp case. And imagine all the people involved in that production. <laughs> well, there are you know? more people involved in a complex trial than yeah, you would think. We'll, you yeah. go back sometimes, I mean, we'll usually take out, you know, a, a two or three large conference rooms at yeah. a hotel where we set up war rooms when we go to trial. Yeah. Uh, because people work throughout the night. Uh, you can sometimes have a case that, you know, a trial that's going to last one or two weeks. Yeah. And there could be hundreds of millions, uh, if not billions of dollars at stake. Wow. And you've got to be able to know. A witness just gave an answer yeah. uh, on day one. And yeah. you want to be able to demonstrate that that answer was not honest. Right. When you go back into court on day two, right. you've got to have people willing to go through the documents. And yes. You have to know how to do the searches on the emails. Yes. To pull up all the documents we wow. need to review overnight. Oh my goodness. And then if we get evidence that, you know, is helpful, we need to get it into a written brief so somebody can hand that to the judge, you know, first thing in the morning and we can have somebody come into court to argue the law. Think about me. all the elements of, I mean, there's 24 traits of genius, but think about all the traits of genius that go through all that process you just said. Like, there's, it's just so much. And there's a lot of logistics that go. Wow. Just like putting a Broadway show. You That's need to get right. the hotel rooms. <laughs> to make sure these wow. people who are working throughout the day and they're are eating. fed properly. Right, exactly. Right. Wow. They wow. Eat food like I do. Wow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it's really, it's a, a team effort and yes. there's a lot more that meets the scenes. And I think putting together a trial team and yeah. actually running a trial yeah. uh, is the that that's the most analogous thing I yeah. Think, yeah putting on a broadway show wow that's pretty incredible i never thought of it that way well i'm so honored to have done this interview with you you're pretty oh. genius oh. and you set a great example for people watching to operate in their traits of genius and this is why i'm doing this series because i really want to encourage young people to really really focus on yourselves right now in present time but also think about the future and operating in your genius will help you create such a bright future for yourself nicholas thank you so much oh, for doing this with us this you. has just been so enlightening and so amazing and so inspiring for me and i hope it has done the same for you 
Thank you so much for tuning in. Please, please, please share this video with as many people as you can. I'm going to put down in the information below um, how to reach him if you need him because he's an amazing lawyer. And if you need help, he's definitely um, here to help you. So thank you so much for watching. And thank you thank so you. much. I really appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.